When a new video game is released, positive reviews, satisfied players and strong sales are all good signs that it has been a success. But every now and then, one will achieve something far greater, and that is a lasting impact on the gaming world. The greatest of which is when new ground is broken, like when Resident Evil 4 popularised the over-the-shoulder third-person camera, or how Final Fantasy VII brought JRPGs to a Western mainstream audience, or how Call of Duty created a safe space for young boys to argue about the sex lives of their opponents' mothers. In 2011, a From Software developer named Hidetaki Miyazaki helmed the very first Dark Souls, and he unapologetically challenged what mainstream consumers thought they wanted from video games. He not only smashed all of those expectations, he smashed them with the force of an overhead attack from a prison balcony, and he shook up and redefined what it meant to be an action RPG. Dark Souls was the first of the Soulsborns to gain true acclaim, and its impact on the gaming world is undeniable, and even more refreshing than a massive breath of dragonfire on a really long bridge. Miyazaki acolytes at this point will be keen to point out that before Dark Souls, there was Demon Souls and they'd be right. Released in 2009, the original Demon's Souls was Miyazaki's first foray into his idea of a dark fantasy setting that took gamers back to the design principles of old, where you would be dropped into a world, perhaps after a short blurb of introductory text or maybe some story slides, and then you would be expected to push on and find your own way. From Software didn't expect much from Demon's Souls, so they let Miyazaki do whatever he wanted, and the end result was much of the groundwork laid for the Soulsborn genre as it exists today. Whilst Demon's Souls was more of a niche success, it was enough for Miyazaki and his team to have another title greenlit, and as he is now the president of From Software, clearly there was something special about his follow-up title. And that is what we are going to talk about today. As you begin your journey and build your character, Dark Souls certainly seems to be starting out innocently enough. You have an attractive amount of choice available in build, equipment, stats and appearance, and the dark fantasy element drips from every pixel. The music is also perfect, instilling a sense of potential and adventure. You get a cool cutscene, and then the music is gone, and you immediately have to fend for yourself, minus the equipment you thought you were going to get. You'll soon find it, of course, but that's only after a freaking massive boss drops in, accompanied by a shift from near silence to a sudden, massive and terrifying orchestral swell. Don't worry though, your equipment is just through this tiny door, on the side, that you have hopefully noticed. It would be a shame if you tried to fight the gargantuan horror with nothing but a broken weapon after all. The introduction sums up Dark Souls perfectly. It's challenging but fair, and it trusts you to figure things out for yourself. Whilst this is all brilliantly designed and certainly something I've talked about before, on my first attempt at Dark Souls the fear hit me long before any of this, before I even loaded the main menu in fact. When the title screen boots up you will hear this noise, and my brain interpreted this as the last thing someone might hear before they fell to a blade, and immediately I felt like this would be a game to approach with caution. This got even more messed up in Dark Souls 3, where the title screen also includes an ominous sounding choir backing. and that made me even more certain I was about to get f***ed up. For context, my best friend growing up was called Damien. Damien! Rectus Dominus! So obviously we spent far too much time watching the Omen films, and as a result, any kind of fateful sounding choir will always get my back up. And where are you from, Damien? The seventh layer of hell! <laughs> As groundbreaking as the design philosophy of the Souls games was, it wasn't actually new. In fact, it was very old and had just been lying dormant, waiting for its chance to strike back. When I was a mere seven years old, my first ever video game was Altered Beast on the Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis if you live stateside. Even if you haven't heard of Altered Beast, you've heard of Sonic and you've heard of Mario, and the point will largely remain the same. You see, whilst you no doubt remember that you could absolutely smash those games when you were a kid, have you tried revisiting them as an adult? I'm the what? I thought I was this guy! Oh! 
Game's over, Grandpa. I got down on the floor for this. They're shockingly hard, right? Well, you're not remembering wrong. You were that good as a kid, but that's because you learned how to beat the game. You learned from your mistakes, which often meant death. You learned because you couldn't just sack off the game and buy another. Your games came from your parents, not your own salary. So if you grew up like I did, you could either persevere and enjoy the games you had, or strap in for a very one-sided debate on what constitutes an ungrateful child. UNGRATEFUL?! Over 30 years ago, I memorized Altered Beast. I knew every enemy type, where they would come from, what their attack patterns were, how to counter them, where ambushes would come from, and how to beat each of the bosses. I didn't do any of this consciously, I just kept trying, and when something didn't work, I'd try something else, and over time, I just got better, or good, if you will. He said it! He said it! Looking back on this as an adult, however, my brain conveniently blocked out the hundreds of deaths that preceded this mastery, and the extremely gradual progress I had to make over and over and over again. Between that era of gaming and this one, a lot has changed, and large strides have been taken to make gaming more accessible. Tutorials, adjustable difficulty settings, exposition and cutscenes, and upgrading your equipment and character stats are just some of the examples of how the industry assists us today. We didn't always have that stuff back then, and Dark Souls doesn't always want us to have it now. Or to be more accurate, Dark Souls doesn't want to just give it to you without you earning it first. Dark Souls does very little to hold your hand. It trusts the player to explore and discover, to rely on and hone their own abilities and learn from their mistakes. Dark Souls dared to be different, and showed the gaming world that gamers wanted a real challenge, based on skill and learning, rather than just grinding for bigger numbers. The 2010s in particular was such an egregious era for games being shipped with tacked on, vapid attempts at multiplayer in an effort to try and trick gamers into playing games for longer. I mean Tomb Raider? Seriously? Dark Souls did the unthinkable and just gave us a really good game. Imagine that. Groundbreaking. The get good philosophy has varying levels of severity depending on which game you play. Sekiro, for example, doesn't give you a choice. You either learn the way of the ninja or you die. Twice. Like your shadow, at least. Yeah, yeah, there it is! There it is! The other Soulsborne games, however, grant a ton of freedom in how you build and equip your character and approach the game. Underpinning all of this, though, is a game that will always push you to get good. Every Soulsborne game is an RPG of sorts, and RPGs have the option to grind for levels and stat boosts. Stronger characters and better gear are always a solid way to level up your game, but they do not equals an automatic win in Dark Souls. To this day, you can still use a glitch to dupe soul items in Dark Souls 1, but the beauty of Dark Souls is that it doesn't matter how high-leveled or well-equipped your character is, you can still absolutely get your ass handed to you by even the most basic of mobs. Overconfidence can be utterly destructive to your efforts, no matter how experienced you are. But that's okay, because all of this combines to create experiences that can always be fresh, even if it's your millionth playthrough. I mean, check this out. You might recognize this clip from some of my other videos, but I can't help reusing it. It is my favorite ever Dark Souls clip. I wasn't trying to do this, it just happened. I'd killed this guy dozens of times by this point, and yet, here we are. If ever there was a clip that so perfectly captures the essence of Dark Souls. Oh, and while we're here, check this out. WHY?! I had no idea he could do this. I figured he'd still be on the stairs. But there I was, recording new footage for this video, and he scared the shit out of me. Only in Dark Souls, guys only in Dark Souls. The Soulsborns are games that you can come back to again and again, and it is much harder to get bored with them than it might be with other games that you know inside out, because they always have the potential to challenge you, no matter how experienced you may be. When Miyazaki decided to create an entire new genre, he didn't just cobble together any old game and make it tough as well as painstakingly constructing a game that was tough but fair throughout... Well, mostly anyway. He also worked to include a whole host of distinctive elements, not always reinventing the wheel, but usually at the very least putting some new tyres on it. Bonfires are the first thing to spring to mind here for me. 
Even for the uninitiated, they spell safety. In a dark and unforgiving land, they speak of light and warmth. As you progress through the game, you will learn quickly how easily and suddenly death can come, and you will get used to the sight of your last used bonfire when you respawn. Travelling ever deeper into harsh and increasingly unforgiving lands never gets any easier, but the relief of finding a new bonfire will usually make you aware of just how much you've been holding your breath. The relief is palpable, but this is Dark Souls, and veterans of the series have no doubt been smugly nodding to themselves this entire time, because they know all too well that if you use a bonfire, you will respawn all the enemies you've just slogged your way through. Bosses and certain noteworthy enemies aside, every dead mob gets undeaded again and they will once again try their best to make you dead. Dude. Another brilliant staple of the series are levels that loop back on themselves to reveal clever shortcuts to earlier areas. The further you progress in your journey, the easier it can be to forget just how far you've come. But then out of the blue you'll find some stairs back to the undead burg, or a lift back to Firelink Shrine. It feels like the game is throwing you a lifeline, encouraging you to explore further, giving you the knowledge that you're not as far from safety as you thought you were. Add to this some fantastic bosses and a decent variety in area biomes, the joy of realising that you've learned an enemy's moveset as you dance around them. Perry! 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 The block! Uppercut. And even the addition of a pretty unique brand of multiplayer. Make Dark Souls the whole package. <laughs> At the time of recording it has been over 12 years since the original Dark Souls, and its influence shows no signs of slowing down. Much like how Doom clones became so ubiquitous that they birthed the first person shooter genre, Souls Likes and Souls clones are everywhere now, and it's not just for the difficult games either. Three of the last four Assassin's Creed games wore their Soulsy combat inspiration proudly on their sleeves, as did the two most recent Star Wars efforts, and easily the best of the Darksiders bunch. And none of this is to speak of the efforts of From Software themselves. Elden Ring has been a gateway into this genre for millions of gamers. Being able to go on my own adventures and build my confidence before taking on Margit was a revelation to me. The funny thing about Elden Ring though, is outside of the huge leaps in freedom and choice you were given, mechanically it was still largely the same game. In fact the core controls haven't changed all that much since the original Dark Souls, they've mostly just gotten faster. Outside of Sekiro, probably the biggest change was Elden Ring adding a jump button. This isn't a complaint though, if anything it's a compliment of the highest order. The controls haven't changed because they haven't needed to, they already work so well, and veterans of the series are already so comfortable with them. Right from the very start, even in times where you had less freedom and space to practice, Dark Souls put getting good entirely on your shoulders because it was made good enough that you could do it. Some of us didn't appreciate this at the time, but we do now and I have no doubt that with every future Soulsborne type game, more and more people will continue to flop back to where it all started, and say, oh yeah, I get it now. In a world oversaturated with video games that use underhanded tactics to artificially pad themselves out and try to keep you playing, one man went against all of that, and just made a really f good game. One that challenged players and trusted them to overcome it. One that left you feeling satisfied when you rolled credits. One stuffed with build variety and secrets to find. One that over a decade later is still pulling in new players and is still providing a satisfying experience to those that know it so well, both in its original form and in its expansive legacy of sequels and spin-offs and imitators. This legacy is not because Dark Souls is hard, it's because it literally is that good. Once you learn Dark Souls, the muscle memory runs deep, and whilst even the goodest player can still have a bad day, they'll never stop coming back. Once you get good, it's in your blood. And there you have it YouTube, those have been my thoughts on why Dark Souls has, and probably always will be, so incredibly popular. I hope you have enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. If you did, then please consider leaving a like, and maybe even subscribing to my channel. And as always, the comments are wide open for all of your Soulsborne stories. Thank you very much for watching guys, see you on the next one.